Hi everyone, so we're gonna start chapter five today, and then after an hour, we're gonna go and do the test one. So that'll be posted at 6.30. So, yeah. So yeah, it'll be posted at 6.30. So we're going to do this for an hour and then we'll do, I'll give you an hour to do the test. And if anyone needs any extra time, that's fine. Like, uh, I'll, as long, like, whatever time you need, I'll provide you. So you can submit it by the, like, you'll have until midnight if you want. It's up to you. Yeah. And then you'll have to submit it through a Dropbox. So I'll show you how to do that. So it'll, yeah, I'll show you how to do that when when I open the assignment. One to four. Yeah, one to four. So don't worry about this chapter. This, this chapter is gonna be on the next test. So yeah, one to four, chapter one to four. Good question. Yeah, so anything learned, anything that I go through today won't be on the test, don't worry. Yeah. So, So, okay, I'm letting some people in and then I'll start. Okay, so we're gonna go through how the government course is and how it can be beneficial and government failure. So government can enforce involuntary transactions and this can be done for positive and negative externalities. So the problem of directing and managing government, there's no invisible hands, it's massive size and scope, the need for bureaucracy, the need for paperwork and inflexibility, the information aggregation problem and the lack of accountability. So government failure is through inefficient outcomes caused by problems in the public sector. So a lot of the time politicians can put their interests above the voters' interests. And that happens that happens a lot in underdeveloped countries. It happens here too, but not as much as in underdeveloped countries. And then also they can put the interest of self-interest groups ahead of majority of voters. So like the wealthy class can be, they can focus on the wealthy class rather than the 99%. So that's a big, big thing that they do. So there is a lot of problems with this, like the principal agent problem, the agents interests can differ from those of the principal. So in this case, the agent would be the government. So agent, equals governments, the principle is the voters. So like the government can, can act against the best interest of the voters. And then special interest affects a small group obtains large gains at the expense of a much larger group who individually suffer small losses. So, so, that happens a lot. Like, so in that case, like the small group would be the 1% of the, the top 1% of wealth in this nation. And then the large group would be the bottom. 99% of wealth in this nation. The small group makes all of its money through capital ownership, stocks, such investments. Yes, that's where, that's where like 99% of the wealth of wealth comes from stocks, investments, 
that's where 99% of the wealth comes from. And then for the larger group, large group, so 99% large group makes all of its money through wage wages and salary. 1% of wealth, less than 1% of wealth, less than 1% of wealth comes from wages and salary. That's a great, so actually more than 99%. More than 99% of wealth comes from stocks and investments. And then 90, so less than 1% of wealth comes from wages and salary. So that's a great, a great lesson. The only way you, you can become wealthy is through ownership of stocks and real estate. So like, you're not going to get rich. So you're not going to get rich through salary. So you won't get rich through salary or wages. You only get rich through stock slash investments slash real estate. So I did, I've done a lot of breakdowns on this. Uh, so this is like the special interest effect. It's related to that. So the special interest so the people that are richer, the 1% of wealth, like, like the 1% group, they, they, can, they have more power in terms of influencing the government to do what they need to do. And they, so I'm going to bring up one of the breakdowns, just, just pause this for a second. So here, this is a good example. So stock ownership is the only way to make a fortune. So like Warren Buffett's salary has been $100,000 per year for the last 40 years. So today his net worth is 108.3 billion. So how did he get to this wealth of 108.3 billion when his salary has been $100,000 for the last 40 years? Here's why. So in 1982, his net worth was $376 million. So he has made over $100 billion during the 39-year period, 39 year period because of stock ownership. So it's all because of stock ownership. That, that's, how it's, that's how it's happened. So he, so like he's made, so he's, his, so from, 1982 to 2021, his, so Warren Buffett's net worth, wealth, let's just call it wealth. Wealth has risen from 376 million to 108.3 billion, uh, greater than, uh, Hundred billion rise in wealth. This has been through almost all stock gains. This is like so. I'll show you why. Because he's on. He was paid a hundred thousand dollar a year salary each year during the past 40 years. So if he was only paid with salary over the past 40 years, he would be worth $4 million. So $100,000 times 40. And that is without spending a dollar of that money. So he's made over more than $100 billion in stock during that period while making almost nothing on salary.
so like it's actually 39 year period so like 39 years times one hundred thousand dollars per year equals like 3.9 million dollars so you made 3.9 million dollars in salary salary during the 39 year period while he made over a hundred billion on stock over that 39 year period so like we can show like three point warren buffett made 3.9 million on wages during the 39 year period while making over 100 billion on stock during the 39 year period therefore stock ownership is way 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 more better than wage slash salary. So yeah, I just wanted to demonstrate that for you because that's this is why people are in the 1%. This is why people have influence over governments because they own stock and investments because they have the money from that. That's where most, that's where almost all the wealth gets concentrated to investments and stock. So I wanted to show you that my blog this is a this is my breakdown here. My blog goes through a lot of that. Um, here it is. Uh, so I, I did one on Bezos. I did a breakdown on Bezos. So I'll show you. So I'll, I'll, I'll go through it briefly. So I went through this breakdown with Bezos. But I go through a lot of this in my blog. Uh, so Jeff Bezos, the second richest person in the world. So he made... Uh, 81,000 per year since 1998. So he would have made 1.8 million during his time at Amazon on salary. And his net worth in 1999 was 10.1 billion. And in 2021, his net worth was 200 billion. So he made 190 billion from stock ownership by uh, during that period. And then he made 1.8 million from salary during that period so like so this is so it shows you how this is another example how it shows you that all of the wealth in the world is concentrated with uh stock and investment owners not wage or salary owners so yeah that's the moral of the story so that that's how people are you know these people that own stock and investments, they they have all the power because they have money to influence governments. So so that's so we'll get back to the slides, but I wanted to show you that breakdown because you could be one of those guys. Like you could be Warren Buffett, you could be the Jeff Bezos if you want to. They salary is not how they got rich. Like no one gets rich through salary. It's it's all stock and 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 uh, investment ownership. So that's that's how you can influence governments through donating, through political donations, and also through buying advertisements and many other methods. Like, and so yeah, the small group of the rich get large gains at the expense of a much larger group that individually suffer small losses. So. The larger group are the salary wage owners, the salary wage earners, and then the small group are the investment and stock owners. So government failure, clear benefits, hidden costs, unfunded liabilities, chronic budget deficits. So those are things that the government does wrong. Like they, they don't pay off their debt. They have budget deficits and debt crises. So, Fiscal policy are attempts to use changes in tax rates and spending level to offset the business cycle. So they can raise spending to, uh, to help the economy, or they can reduce taxes to help the economy. So that's what they can do with fiscal policy. So like, uh, so in that case, like 
Harper, say like Harper reduced taxes, Trudeau increased spending, and both both help the economy. So those are those both things do help the economy. And then monetary policy attempts to use changes in interest rates to regulate the economy. So lowering the interest rate and increasing the money supply. Yeah. So those are ways to uh, help the economy. So you can do all that to help the economy. So like politicization of fiscal monetary policy, conservatives are usually focused on uh, like reduce taxes and reduce spending. And then liberals are like, uh, like keep taxes steady and increase spending. So that, that's usually how they go. And then like, like NDP are like increased taxes for the rich and uh, increased spending. So that's kind of like how they are. Fiscal and monetary policy are different for each. Conservatives like are reduced interest rates. So this would be fiscal here. And then this would be monetary. And then this would be fiscal. And then monetary, uh, they pretty much both want interest, uh, reduce interest rates. And then the NDP, they, they, they would agree with that too. So like monetary reduced interest rates. So yeah, like that's kind of like the politicization. And then central banks in charge of money supply. So like uh, the central bank, so Bank of Canada is the central bank. They are keeping the interest rate low to reduce borrowing costs. And this is so like in order for businesses to have cheaper ways to fund their operations and people to get mortgages and loans. So that, that's, that's a good breakdown on that. So then like there's deregulation could be a good thing because it can make business is more free and able to innovate and create. And then government can make pro make issues, like can have issues with investments. They can invest in the wrong things and lose money. Uh, so, so examples like deregulation can be good for like with like Elon Musk, deregulation, give him more creative freedom and then government poor investment track record can increase deficits because they won't be making money and then loan guarantees so the tarp uh asset program in the united states in 2008 guaranteed bad mortgages and the government had trillions in debt due to this. Yeah, so that, that, that loan guarantees can cause a lot of debt. And then socializing losses, privatizing gains, so socializing losses, uh, TTC, and go transit lose money because of transit stops in low demand areas owned by the government. And then privatizing gains. So like privatizing gains, the Ontario government 
selling the 407 and Hydro One. Therefore, the investment returns from these assets go to investors instead of the government. So that's not a good thing for the government because they have less money coming in. So that they're not, they can't pay off the debt. Yeah. So then uh, corruption, political corruption, the unlawful misdirection of government resources or actions for personal gain, two basic forms of corruption, government official bribed to do part of his job, government official demands bribes to do something illegal. So, so these are the, so they did a survey and they found that Sierra Leone had the highest rate of bribes in this chart. So over 80%. And then Italy is last, the least on this chart, United States second least. So it still happens in the United States, but very low compared to a lot of other countries. Um, usually, so when countries become more developed and so when countries become more developed, Um, more developed and more democratic, there are less bribes, usually. So like us, Italy, and the United States are developed and democratic, while like places like Sierra Leone, Sierra Leone, is un was like autocratic and underbelt. So like, yeah, uh, you want to have more development and more democracy, and that'll reduce the bribes that happen. So that's that's really key. So yeah, governments are imperfect. There's a lot of issues with efficiency, and markets and yeah, they're both they're both imperfect. So we're going to play a game. I'm just going to set it up. So which one does everyone want to play? Which uh, so Gold Quest, Fishing Frenzy, Crypto Hack, Tower Defense, Cafe, Battle Royale, Factory Racing, or Classic? Classic. Okay, cool. Sounds good. Classic. Yeah, we'll just do classic today and then we might like we'll do another one next time okay so let's see that so here you go so join in with that link So if someone hasn't joined in, we can we'll start, but you can still join any when even when we're started. Uh, so yeah, join at any time.
this one's a good question. So pay attention to the answer. It's it's a good question. So yeah, the answer is they loan the money to banks a certain rate of interest. So that's that's how it works. Like they loan them uh, usually to fund uh, deposits. So usually to, to fund withdrawals because the deposits are being currently lent out as mortgages. So they need to, they need money for withdrawals.
Great job, everybody. Great game. Excellent game, everybody. Good job, everyone. So we will start the next PowerPoint. I'll just bring it up. So we're going to go through public choice theory, the economic analysis of government decision making, politics, and elections. So there's a lot of issue with with like who people vote for and what the policies of the government are. That like so they may vote. Let's say they vote for party A. I vote for party A, right? Party A does not provide good funding for transit, let's say, right? And I want good transit. So there is an inefficient inefficiency to voting because you because a lot because people can vote for a party that does not meet what they need so like yeah so like i so in this case i vote for a party that does not give me transit, right? And I want transit. So, so that happens a lot, right? Like that happens a lot in politics and that's a problem with voting. Voting is inefficient because you, you end up getting disappointed because you might've voted for a party that doesn't give you what you want. So that, that's what happens. So yeah, like in this case, like, Inefficient no vote is when total benefit is greater than total costs. So, so like you could be saying no to to party. You vote no, like you you vote no to party B, even though party B will give you what you want. So this is an inefficient no vote because you're voting against what you want. Yeah. And then if inefficient yes vote is a uh, total benefit, those total costs is uh, greater than total benefit. You vote yes to party A, even though party A will not give you what you want. So the total cost is greater than total benefit. So this is inefficient. Like you, you got, the problem is this happens a lot in voting. It's very inefficient because you vote for the wrong party. And, and yeah, it's a real problem. Yeah. So those who have a strong preference for public good may band together. So interest groups form a lot of them are like, let's say rich people come together. So like it'd be rich people come together to lobby for something they want. So like rich people wanting lower taxes, education workers wanting higher salary, medical workers wanting better pay. So like these might be uh, interest groups, right? And then political log rolling, the trading of votes to secure favorable outcomes. So like lobbying. So lobbying, lobbyists, meeting with government officials. 
to educate politicians on what is best for business. So like that that does happen. Lobbyists are that the what or do do that constantly. So then So yeah, like it's important to vote for what what you need, basically. So like if if uh, so Adams first choice is for national defense. So like let's say like so party so party A is like the national defense party. And then uh, road is party B, like the road party is the party is party B, and then the party that works that is concerned about weather warning systems is party C. So in an efficient world, uh, so Conrad. So in an efficient world, Conrad votes for party C because. Conrad wants weather warning systems. And then in an efficient world, Benson votes for party B because Benson wants roads in an efficient world adams votes for party a because he, adams wants national defense so yeah that that's how efficiency should happen like but it doesn't work that way usually people vote for like a leader like a particular leader uh, not because of their policies, usually because of like how they, what they feel gut about the leader, like their gut instinct about the leader. That's usually how they vote. So the pro that's that's a big problem because it becomes inefficient. They don't vote based on what they need it's because of the gut instinct of the voters. So like um, inefficiencies happen in voting because the voters don't vote based on what they need they vote for the leader they have a gut instinct about so that, that's just what happens which is unfortunate so and i'm an independent yeah i'm i'm an independent uh, voter yeah so explain the difficulties of conveying economic preferences through majority voting. So it's important to, yeah, like, like I said, public choice theory suggests that governments may sometimes suffer from failures because majority voting fails to correctly indicate voter preferences. So like there might be not enough resources or too many resources. And yeah, so it's important to, that's why the median voter model, like it shows that the person with the middle position on the issue will uh, win most likely. So we got through this. I'm going to show a quick video on a lot of the monetary and fiscal policy, and then we will start the, well, then we'll start the term test. I'm just gonna bring up the video. macroeconomic circles are monetary policy, monetary policy, and fiscal policy. 
and fiscal policy. And they're normally talked about in the context of ways to shift aggregate demand in one direction or another, and oftentimes to kind of stimulate aggregate demand, to shift it to the right. And what I want to do in this video is focus on what these two different tools are, who are the actors, and how do they go about actually shifting the aggregate demand curve. So monetary policy, this is literally deciding how much money to print. So it's literally printing money. Either deciding to print more of it or deciding to print less. Printing money. It tends to be done, in the United States especially, in most large countries, it's done by the central bank. It's done by the central bank, which is sometimes directly part of the government. Sometimes it's quasi-independent. In the US, it's a quasi. The US central bank, which is the Federal Reserve, is quasi-independent. And in future videos, we'll talk more about the governance structure of the Federal, of the federal Reserve. M most of the major appointees are made by the US government. All of its excess profits goes back to the US Treasury. So in that way, it's part of the US government. But it's set up to be also has some influence from private industry. The member banks have a, have a stake in what's going on. It, co it often coordinates amongst member banks. So you have your Federal Reserve as a central bank in the United States. It's quasi-independent, but it's been given the right to print money. And I'll just draw it here as physical dollars, but most of the money that it's going to print actually is electronic money. And the way this affects the aggregate demand curve, the Federal Reserve doesn't just print money and go out and start buying things with that money. Well, it does buy things, but it doesn't go out and buy goods and services. What it does with this is it essentially lends it out. So it's essentially buying debt. So it buys, it buys debt. And if buying debt seems like a weird thing to say, buying debt is the same thing as lending money. Lending money. If I buy a treasury bond, so if I'm buying debt, I'm buying a treasury bond it means I'm implicitly lending that money. If I buy the bond directly from the government, that means I'm lending that money to the US government. If I buy, if I directly buy a bond from a US corporation, I'm essentially lending that money to the corporation. They're going to give me interest payments in the form of coupons, and then they're going to pay back that money at some future date. So this is essentially lending money. And what this does is it's increasing the supply of money that's out there to be lent. And so if we think of the market for money, so let's see, now we're going to think in microeconomic terms for the market for money. So the market for money, if this is the price of money, which is really just the interest rate, so interest interest rate as a percentage. And this right over here is the supply of money. Supply of money. And I'll just draw, so this might be our supply curve. That's supply. And this is the demand curve. This is demand curve. And let's say right over here, let's say, and let's say this is short term money, and we won't focus on the different durations and all of that. But let's say we're sitting right over here at a clearing interest rate of 5%. So it makes sense. So this is right here. This is our demand, our demand curve. So all of the people who will get more than 5% benefit out of the money, maybe they have an investment where they could get 10% on the money, or 8%, or 5.1%, they're all willing to borrow that money and then invest it in whatever they want to do. Or this might even be consumption. People who are say, hey, 5%, that's worth it for me to go out and buy that thing that makes me whatever happy. But from an investment point of view, it makes even more sense. If I'm going to get an 8% return on my money, that's my benefit, it makes sense for me to borrow it at 5%. It makes sense all the way up to 5.00. 0.01%, I'd actually borrow it. And so when the Federal Reserve, or any central bank, prints money and it buys debt, it goes out into debt markets and it buys, it usually buys the safest kind of debt, but that affects all of the debt markets. It goes out and buys debt market, they're essentially shifting the supply curve of money to the right. They shift the supply curve to the right. And so at any given interest rate, you could say that they are, there is more money. And so the supply curve might look something like that. And this is interesting because assuming that demand has not shifted, what you now have is a different clearing price, a different equilibrium price for the money. Maybe this is now at 3%. This is now at 3%. And you also have more money being lent and borrowed. So if this was the old quantity of money that was lent and borrowed, let's say that this is, I'm just going to make up a number here. Let's say that this is, let's say this is 100. $100 billion in some time period, and now we're at $120 billion. $120 billion. So now by essentially printing money, buying debt, increasing the supply of money, two things happened. Interest rates went down, and so now you have all of these characters out here 
who before they weren't going to borrow money at 5% because whatever they were their benefit on that money was between 5% and 3%, maybe it was 4% or 3.5%. It didn't make sense for them to borrow at 5% and invest it or get and only get a, a 4% return or a 3% return, but now that interest rates have gone down, now it does make sense for them to borrow the money all the way down to someone who has some type of project or investment that has a 3% return. They they also say, "Hey, I'm neutral. I could borrow at 3% and then I could invest." But definitely the person with 3.1% or 3.2% if they have investments that give them that much they would definitely want to borrow and we could assume that all this incremental borrowing so in this little example that I did right over here all this incremental 20 billion dollars of borrowing is going to be spent people will borrow money not to just like not to just sit but stuff it into their uh, into their mattresses they'll borrow that money to go invest it in some way to spend it and so what this will do all of this will shift aggregate demand to the right right here we're talking in microeconomic terms but then if we think about aggregate supply and demand so this is aggregate so this is let me write aggregate aggregate right over here this is price this is real gdp this is our aggregate demand aggregate aggregate demand and then our short run aggregate supply might look something like this aggregate supply in the short run and so if we're shifting aggregate demand to the right where there's going to be more demand for goods and services these people are going to borrow this money and spend it you're going to essentially stimulate you are going to stimulate the economy. So if this shifts to the right, you have a situation where real GDP will go from this state to this state right over here. So it was expansionary. And obviously, if the Federal Reserve decides to print less money, or if they even decide to if they essentially soak up the money that's in the market by selling some of the debt that they own so that they're sucking dollars out of it, then the opposite effect would happen. Now fiscal policy is essentially the government directly going out there and demanding goods and services from the economy. So this is essentially you have the government, you have the government, it has two sources of revenue that it can spend. It has money from taxes, it has tax revenue, and then it can go out and borrow money. And so it also has access to debt markets. And the, when a government borrows money, they're essentially issuing treasury bills. If you're talking about the US treasury bills and treasury bonds, if you were to buy those from the US government, you are essentially lending money to the government to finance their debt. And so they can take these two sources of money, and then if they decide to do if they decide to spend more and let's say that they're going to hold taxes fixed, so they're not going to take out any demand from the economy, they might ratchet up debt and then ratchet up spending ratchet up spending and then that this government is directly going out there and demanding more goods and services so that could also shift the aggregate demand curve to the right so these are two different levers two different tools that have been used in governments all around the world to shift aggregate demand one way or another or, or to an attempt to shift aggregate demand one way or the other monetary policy is more indirect printing money using that to increase the supply of money that's out there to be lent that lowers interest rates and then because it lowers interest rates more money there, more, there's more willingness to borrow and invest that money fiscal policy you're di you're directly going out there and just buying more goods and services by usually ratcheting ratcheting up your debt or fiscal policy could go the other way if you're trying to restrain the economy you could lower your debt lower your spending or you could do some other combination So that, that's a great, that's an excellent video on showing you how to, like, how to, uh, it's a great video on showing how the monetary and fiscal policy uh, work. So I made the, I just made the test available. So go under assignments and then go to term test one and uh, download it. And then you can open it up. So I'll share my screen with it. So here, here it is. So answer all these questions. I'll give you the, the next hour so until 7.30, but if you need more time, that's fine too. Just try to submit it by midnight. If uh, like take as much time as you need, but try to submit it by midnight. Uh, so answer all these questions and and then
you can do it below you can do it highlighted it's up to you just just make it known just like bold it underline it that kind of thing just make it known just make it visible but yeah go to so then term test one click on this and then you submit it by doing browse local files and then clicking like what what document is that you filled out or you can add comments you can put down like what you can also do is you can do like a 1a 2b you can fill it out here you can fill out your answers if you want it's up to you whatever you want to do uh, and so on it's up to you and then just press submit so like you can do it, you can upload it, browse local files, or you can add comments. It's up to you how you want to submit it. Uh, either way is fine for me. Just just provide me with all the letters. So 30, 30 questions and letter for each one, a letter answer. But yeah, so does anyone else have any questions? And if you have any questions, just this is my email. Uh, send me an email. And if you don't get a response back fast enough, just send me a WhatsApp message. Uh, yeah, just either way, both work. So good question. I'll just bring up the bring up the TLP. Yeah, I'll actually have to bring up the course outline. So it's going to be 15% of your mark. So 15% of your mark is this turn test. 15%. Yeah. 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 So 15% of your mark. And uh, yeah. So yeah. Yeah. So check the TLP in the course outline. Uh, so does anyone else have any other questions? Yeah, you can do bold. You can highlight your answers. Just make it visible. Yeah. Just make it, make it shown. Uh, yeah, just make it make it obvious that it's the answer. Yeah, like bold, underlined. Yeah, that both work. Just make it obvious. It's so it's I'm gonna give you the next hour to do it. So until 7 30. But if you need to, if you need to take the rest of the night, you can just try to submit it by midnight. Midnight is kind of is the due date. So like I'll give you, yeah, I'll give you until midnight. Yeah. But yeah, I'll, um, yeah, I just wanted to give you more time if you need it. But yeah, um, does anyone else have any questions? Um, good question. I'm not, I can't confirm that yet. I'm still working with, so yeah, I can't confirm that yet. I'm still, uh, figuring that out. Uh, but good question. Uh, yeah, good question. I'll, but I'll, I'll let, I'll, I'll let you all know how it will be formatted. Like, uh, if it does change but yeah i'm still working with it on that yeah any other questions everybody okay great participation today got everybody uh, excellent work i is very very active class i really like it it's great uh yeah and uh reach out to me if you have any questions about the test and uh, great work today i'm just gonna close out the zoom but so i'm gonna i'm gonna close out the zoom everybody
and then I'll post the recording, but good luck in the test and uh, message me if you have any questions and I'll, I'll answer them. But if, if I, you don't get a response from me on, uh, on, on email, I'm more accessible through WhatsApp. So just send me a message on there then I'll help. But yeah, have a good night, everybody. Good luck on it. And just uh, let me know if you have any questions. Great work today, everybody. Yeah, you too. Bye.